Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearless. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Together? But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether false motive or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Amen. Today's sermon title is Advance of the Gospel. Okay? Um, to give you a background on what's going on here, Apostle Paul, he's sitting in a jail cell. And he's writing the, uh, a letter of encouragement uh, to the church in Ephesus, uh, not Ephesus, Philippians wouldn't make sense, um, to the Philippians. And usually what happens in the, Old, uh, the New Testament, Old Testament, what's going on? New Testament letters, uh, when they first initially write in the first chapter is greetings. And they give an update on what's been going on in their lives. And so um, Paul, it's right for him to start off saying, oh, look, I'm in jail and this is what I'm going through and things like that. But interestingly so, he doesn't really talk about the struggles and the difficulties that he has sitting in a jail cell, right? He says, you know, all these things that are happening to me is for the advancement of the gospel. And, and the whole book of Philippians, the way I love it is in his current situations and the circumstances that he's in, what he's going through, he's able to really rejoice and find the true joy of the Lord, right? And that's why he was able to see it in this just small four chapter book 16 times to rejoice. And so... Um, you know, thinking about it, like if I was sitting in a jail cell, being arrested for preaching, let's say I'm just preaching right now and someone, some police officers come in and they're like, we, we have to take you away and they just arrest me. I'm not going to be sitting in a jail cell, oh, praise God, you know. I'm going to be like writing a letter to Stem, dear Stem, get me out of here, do whatever you can, you know, call, call any, you know, lawyers or whoever you know and please get me out of here as soon as possible. By the way, you know, uh, bring me some Twix and make some visitations or whatever, right? I would say all these requests of wanting to get out of that situation, but Paul is not even thinking about his health, not even thinking about his current situation or what he's dealing with right now, but he's so focused on the advancement of the gospel. And this is such uh, something that we can really learn from. And so today I want to be able to look at this passage and what can we then become like this guy Paul and how was he able to withstand and get through these difficult times and how for us can we have really be able to rejoice and get through situations as well. Okay? Um, to give you a background, uh, again, Paul, I said he's writing in prison and it's, um, one of his biggest ambition was to reach Rome. Okay, and so if you look at Acts 19.12, it says, After all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Asia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. So one of his top priorities was to get into the city of Rome. Why? Because during that time, Roman Empire was the biggest thing. It was the biggest city. And so he thought, as long as I can get into that city of Rome, then I have this great opportunity to have the gospel spread all across. For example, if a missionary came and uh, Korea wasn't a Christian country, they would first target Seoul, right? The biggest city where all the people are. And from that city, people will be able to uh, know the gospel and by word of mouth, it will continue to go down to other cities, right? And that's the goal that pa Paul had. And so his, one of his biggest goals in life during this time when he wanted to share the gospel was to bring the good news to Rome. And only if I have that opportunity and that chance for me to get into that city, man, the gospel will go forth and it will advance and I will be so happy to really be working for the Lord. That was his ultimate goal, right? So he has this goal and he gets to Rome, but it's not the way he expected and wanted, right? Because he, he's thinking, well, I want to go and, and, and be able to march in and enter into the city and be able to share God's word and be preaching. But that's not how he happens. He goes and he's arrested and right away he's sitting in a prison cell waiting his execution. He's not just there, but he's waiting his execution, waiting to die, right? Thinking about the conditions of the jail cell, okay? Um, for a second, I was going to ask, has anyone visited jail? But that would be a wrong question. Um, 
I had the opportunity to go to jail, uh, not go to, sorry, not go to jail, <laughs> visit a jail. Wow, what's going on? Uh, I had the opportunity to visit a jail, okay? Um, my record is clean, don't worry. Um, because part of my seminary experience, one of my classes, uh, we were to go into a prison cell and we were to minister to the people there. And um, they actually have a Wednesday service amongst themselves. And it was pretty incredible how, uh, you know, we were going as a class and they're like, you know, bring your identification, your, your driver's license, and they do all your background check before you get into the place. And, and they do all of that. And, and we were all nervous and shaking. We we're like, oh, what's going to happen to us? What if we don't make it out? And, you know, what if there's like prison break and you watch all these movies that flash through your mind and like, oh, I'm panicking. And, and we went in with that state and thinking, what if these people all of a sudden, say like they're like singing Jesus loves you and they're like staring at you and like oh they want to fight you or something like what do we do right I was so scared and so hesitant but the opposite happened like of like five six of us we had the opportunity to go into after like going through nine security doors we finally went in and we met people who are on death row um, death row if you guys don't know is they don't have an opportunity to get out of jail right they'll be spending the rest of their lives in jail and as soon as we went in, man, these people greeted, greeted us with hugs and it was their worship service that we were participating in. And you can really sense God's spirit just in that room. And everyone was just on their feet and like they didn't care about anything. They just truly worship God. And that just put all of us who are seminarians studying to be, the word, uh, be pastors, studying the word of God, put to shame. And I thought, do I ever worship like these people? Do I ever look at God in this sense where it doesn't matter who's around or anything that's in their lives? And if you think about it, these people don't really have much hope in a sense where they won't have a chance to get out of jail. But they're in there, they don't, you know, despite their situations and circumstances, they're just freely worshiping God. And when I read this text, I was so reminded of that time when I was sitting there just in awe of, of the presence of God upon these people. And they were worshiping God in this way, right? And this is how Paul kind of, his heart was. It didn't matter what kind of situations or circumstances that he was in, right? I mean, luckily for me, the, the prison that I visited in the U.S., it was a very nice facility, right? Um, not a desirable place, but it was, you know, they had AC and they had like all these, they had rooms and things like that. But back then in the Roman times, it wasn't like that. It was probably everything was all barred up, probably dirt, mud on the floor. It was wet. It was dark. It was damp. Not only that, but they were chained to these guards all the time. It was a very uncomfortable situation. And yet, Paul was able to rejoice. Paul was able to really look beyond his circumstances and situations and be able to only think about the word of God and the advancement of the gospel, right? What an incredible guy that he was, that he had this type of a heart and this type of a passion. Do you have a passion for God, or for his word, for his worship in this sense? Do you really long for God and love God with this type of heart? That without it, man, I can't just go on today without worshiping God. I can't go on without reading God's word today. Do you ever get that sense when there's people out there who are stuck in prison and yet they're going all out, not holding back on anything? We ought to really think about ourselves where we come into a sanctuary, it's all AC'd up and we're comfortable and, and we'll, you know, we can, we're free to worship and yet we don't. Right? And so, Thinking about Paul and his heart that he had, he really, you can really get a sense that he really loved the Lord and had this true passion for God. What are some of the things that you are passionate about in your life? Think about it. That something that you're, you know, your mom is always calling you to eat. I know I, that always comes to mind. I think I'm traumatized by how my mom called me to eat all the time. Um, but you know how they call you to eat, but you're, you're like disregarded because uh, you're, you disregard that because you're so into something, right? Because you're so into this problem number six on the math SAT problem. You're like, oh, I got to solve this. I can't eat. Or you're studying and you're so caught up in that that you don't see anything else. For me, when I was younger, it was basketball, right? For a group of us, for, uh, me and a couple of friends, in, in a snowy day, it would be piles of snow outside. We'd go outside, shovel snow so that we can ha have the driveway to just shoot around, right? We didn't care how cold it was. We didn't care what the weather was. It didn't matter. We were so focused on that. And that's where our passion was. For Paul, 
his passion was truly for the advancement of the gospel. And that's the first thing that he addresses here, right? Verse 12, now I want you to know, brothers, that whatever, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's not saying, you know, what has happened to me? You know, I was going around preaching God's word and man, I can't believe I'm here. I'm stuck here, right? And thinking about it from the church's perspective, it's taking someone who is really um, well-known, who can really work for the kingdom of God, and they just lock them up. It's like, how many of you guys been following the NBA Finals? Okay, like three of you. Do you guys know what NBA Finals is? It's not an exam. Um, it's the championship game, right? It's the championship game in, in, in basketball. And for Cleveland, it's like Cleveland versus Golden State right now. And for Cleveland, uh, one of their best players is LeBron James. Do you guys know LeBron James? Just not. Okay. Uh, so he's a good player. And so let's say um, for Cleveland, the, uh, the, the commissioner of the NBA says, oh, LeBron is practicing too much. He can't, he, we're going to suspend him for the rest of the series. How would the city of Cleveland react if they take away their best player, then they don't have a better chance to win the championship. They would go crazy. People would go on riots and things like that, right? Paul is the LeBron James of the gospel in this sense. He's the most important person. And people at the church are saying, this is the guy who is advancing the gospel. This is the guy we need in the forefront for him to really go preach the gospel for us, and yet you're just locking him up, right? And people are being furious in this sense, but Paul's really calm, right? In his passionate sense, he says, rejoice, my brothers, right? I can just picture him in the jail cell. Rejoice, everything will be okay, right? He's a very like, you know, it's very soothing and calming as you read this in the midst of trials and circumstances that you're going through. And so you can really get a sense of this passion that he has really for the word of God, okay? Let me read 12 and 13 again. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ, okay? Wow, man, he's like, he's saying, I am in captivity, I am in chains for Christ, but it doesn't matter because the gospel of Jesus Christ is going forth in this way. Right? It's such an incredible statement that we're seeing. So to understand what the heck he's talking about here, right, we need to understand what's going on with the Roman guards. Right? Back then, what had happened was um, they had something, um, the imperial guards, the praetorians, the guard of um, the top-notch guards who were under the emperor, right, they held a huge military unit. Okay? And so um, it says that they had about 12 cohorts with thousand soldiers each under them. And so all together, there are 12,000 soldiers, right? It's an incredible army, a huge military. And so when a prisoner comes in, they would take shifts and turns. And so if I was arrested and Pastor Mike is the guard, he would come for six hours, he would tie me up and he would tie me up to himself and we would be in chains together for six hours. And then the next person comes, you know, Tim Sam will come and they two will switch off and Tim Sam will attach to me and we'll just sit there for six hours. And so six hour shifts. So in a 24 hour period, that is how many people? Very good. Some people are, their minds are working. Some people are, it's too hard for you. Um, it's four, okay? Four every six hours, right? So think about that. Every six hours, you have to spend with no choice with Paul. Now, Paul is not a normal guy, like I mentioned. He was filled with passion. He's excited for the word of God. He's, he's going all out, but not holding anything back. Think about you being attached to a person, and you're just doing your job, and you're sitting there, and this guy is preaching the word of God at you for six straight hours. You're like, oh my goodness, I get it. Okay, Jesus died for me. Yeah, okay. Next, the next person comes with the same energy and passion. He's like, do you know God loves you? Do you know he died for you upon the cross? And they're like, oh, right? It gets to that point where it says the whole, in verse 13, throughout the whole palace guard, not just three or four people were changed through Paul sharing the word of God, but the whole palace guard. Now, how many people were there of military rule, uh, people? So whole, everyone was able to hear the word of God through this one man, right? Because of his passion. 
right? And he's saying, look, I came to, I wanted to go to Rome so bad and I'm here. You know, I, it's not the way that I wanted to come through, but I came through a prison. I'm stuck here, but praise God because God is putting people by my side to share the gospel with 24 seven. And what greater privilege is there than this? Right? And he's saying, that's why he says, praise God. And, and it's all for the advancement of the gospel. And that's why he's able to rejoice. I mean, this is not a normal dude, right? He's really sold out and passionate for Jesus Christ and what he has done for him upon his life. And because of this, he wanted to go out and share. What about you? Now, let me, let me put this out at you. What if you are tied to someone? Okay, you, maybe not a soldier. Okay, for a soldier, we're come, coming and you are tied to them for six hours at a time, for a 24-hour period, just for one day. What would they say about your life? Because for Paul, they looked at his life and what they experienced was like, man, this guy was rejoicing and he's happy and he's really worshiping God and he's sharing the word of God. He wouldn't stop. But what about for you, right? If a soldier was attached to your arm, what would they say? Would they say, oh, are you, are you a Christian? I, oh, I thought you went to church. What about the things that you say out of your mouth? You know, is it really pleasing to God? Are you involved with what everyone in the world is involved with? With the gossip or cursing people or putting down people or there's no difference between the people of the world and you as a Christian. I think it's something that we really ought to think about and reflect. How am I really living my life? Am I really living my life passionately for God or am I just playing church and acting like it in a way at times? I mean, this ought to really help us to think, man, I need to get my life together and think about how real God is in my life. How seriously do I want to take my faith with the Lord? Because Paul, this meant everything. He gave up, he was willing to put his life on the line. You know, he was waiting his execution. Let me tell you again, waiting his execution, waiting to die. And yet he was pouring everything out for at least one person to be saved. And you know what? He lived it out in his life. It wasn't just one time. It wasn't just once a week. It wasn't just when he felt like it or wanted to, but this was his life, that Christ was so real in his life that he couldn't contain himself. I pray that we really get to experience the love of God. Amen? To this point where he truly becomes our one and only passion, knowing that when we place our trust in him and hold on to the Lord, while everything in the world may perish, Christ will not. That when we have Christ, we can face anything in this world with the true confidence of his word. Okay? And I hope we, we get to that point as Paul really experienced the passion of Jesus Christ. Second thing that we see is Paul was falsely accused. That's why he's in jail. Right? He was preaching the gospel and people are saying, oh, he's, you know, he's going against the Roman rule and we should just throw him in jail. And so he's sitting in jail and, and the Roman um, guards, they must be thinking, well, he's in jail because he's been cursing us out and saying bad things about us. And, you know, he deserves to die. And, you, you know, that's right. You, you, you know, you deserve to rot in this prison. And he, they must be thinking that. But that's not what they see, right? As I mentioned, as he is tied up, he's rejoicing. He's happy. He's really worshiping God. He's writing letters of encouragement, which is crazy in this circumstance and situation. So he doesn't let anything, whether circumstances or situation or whatever difficulty that he was going through in his lifetime, he didn't let those things get the best of him, right? He really wanted to desire and worship God in this way. And as, you know, picture yourself as the guard, okay? You're the guard and you see this guy going all crazy. And so is, you might be thinking, is he on drugs? How can you be so happy? How can you be so joyful and so excited for something that you've been repeating to so many of us all this time, nonstop? How is that possible? What is it about this guy? And they, and they begin to question. Maybe, you know, maybe I, I should try what he's on or whatever he's do, experiencing, right? Because if you look at the people, the, uh, there are probably other prisoners in that prison cell. And they are there maybe going after the things of the world they, they thought it will satisfy. Maybe they were trying to rob a bank or something like that, but they didn't have banks probably back then. But um, they were trying to do something to really make their lives better, to be pleasing in the worldly sense, but there was no satisfaction. 
But Paul was able to really rejoice and have this true joy that surpasses all knowledge, as he says in chapter 4, that was unstoppable joy, right? Unstoppable joy. We talked a little bit about that last week of how we tend to focus so much on seeking happiness and not God. But Paul got it right. Paul sought after God, not happiness, and in turn, he was able to get everlasting joy. I mean, that, isn't that what you want, right? I mean, just look at the people around you. They look so joyful and so happy to be here, right? And some of them are so happy that they have their eyes closed thinking so deeply, right? Um, you know, like, we want to get that joy that Paul has experienced, right? And Paul was falsely ex uh, accused and people were able to see the change and difference in that and they wanted to be a part of what he was a part of. I hope we get to that point that we truly represent Christ in the outer world, right? In this way where people ask us when, you know, we might not be tied up, as I mentioned, like these, um, like two prison guards or soldiers, but we do have people around us that we spend a lot of time with. For instance, when you go to school, it's like you're tied up with people of your friends for six, seven hours at a time, right? And so if they were to examine your life, maybe you're the only person that they'll be able to get to know who God is through. And if you are representing God in not the right way that, that who he really is, right? They will have a misunderstanding about who God is. And so that's something to think about too. When you're at school, six, seven hours a day at a time, when your friends see you, how do they see you? Do they see you as a true follower of Christ, really passionate for God on an everyday setting? Or do they just know you as a churchgoer and see Christianity altogether as just another religion? Because that's what people tend to do, right? Oh, Christianity, oh, it's just a religion, the Sunday thing, ritual, and, you know, and just move on with it. They don't really, they will never know the heart of Christ if you don't live it out in your life with them. Okay? And also, same thing at home, wherever we are, we ought to really represent Christ in this way. Um, thirdly, uh, when Paul was captive, um, verse 14, let's look at verse 14. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Right? Now, these prisoners, these prison guards heard the gospel message and they were able to go out and, and encourage and, and speak fearlessly, right? I mean, praise God for that. They get to that point where, where nothing can stop them to really, you know, advance the gospel. And therefore, those soldiers went into Rome and shared the gospel message to go forth. I mean, isn't that what God is calling us to do here? To really experience the word of God and experience who he is, get to know who he is for us. And for us to go out and live the life so that people may recognize who God is. Not who we are, but who God is. Amen? And, and this is what God is really calling us to. And we need to have that type of a mindset. Knowing that God can really give us the word to, for us to really have the confidence, to have this courage, and to go out fearlessly to really proclaim the word of God. And that has to come with us first experiencing who God is the love of God upon our hearts, right? Um, and Paul was able to teach, you know, reach the lost people, encourage other people. That's, I think that's one of the most incredible things that he does here. Not, he doesn't encourage because he's in a better state than anyone else. He's in a better position to. He does it because he solely loves others as Christ has loved him. What about you? Can you encourage your brothers and sisters in STEM? Let's start with STEM, maybe Bible study, in your Bible studies, to really encourage them with the Word of God throughout the week when you see them outside church, right? Because most of the time we say, oh, let's be encouraging, and we can do it all here. And we're like, oh, yeah, it's so easy, and we go around and say a few things and then move on. But then when you, what about when you are outside STEM? Can you still do the same? Can you still do it when you are having such a bad week? Can you still be encouraging for others? being reminded that Christ has died for you, okay? This is what Paul was able to do with that true passion. And I hope we come, become that community where we can really be encouraging so that people may have the word of God and be fearless about it. Fearless about the word of God. Be courageous in this sense. And lastly, let's look at verses 15 through 18. It says, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. 
The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I, I, I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So what was happening again when he was in prison, all these other preachers were coming up, and they're saying, yes. You know, some people were saying, yes, this is my opportunity to shine. Some people were really praying for Paul, right, on behalf, on behalf of Paul. But think about it, right? Paul was a well-known person all throughout, you know, the community as the guy, the LeBron James, okay? You'll, you'll remember that. When you see LeBron, be like, oh, Paul. Um, so he, he was that guy. And so people are like, oh, he's finally in, in prison. Now it's my time to shine, my turn for people to recognize what I can do. Look, I have followers too. People are listening to me and I have a crowd too. I have a following, right? What's Paul gonna do? He's in prison, so I can do whatever, right? And so people had this jealous heart about Paul because he was the number one guy, right? You know, um, they were hating on this guy and so they were happy. And so he says, Paul says, you know what? It doesn't matter. As long as God's word is going forth, People can hate me all they want, as long as Christ is preached. I mean, can you do that? Would you be able to do that? When Did you ever, growing up, you have that one kid in your class or uh, amongst all your mom's friends that always got like straight A's, right? For me in fourth grade, there was a kid named Mark. We called him Dorky Mark. And he always got A's on everything. And you know, when, when you come home, you're like, how'd you do on the exam? Your parents ask you, you're like, oh, I did okay, right? You know, we always say we did good, right? Because who's gonna say I did bad, right, to the parents. Um, I, so I always say I did good, and, and then my parents are like, yeah, right, let's see the results. Uh, um, and then, then they're like, oh, you know, they go out and talk to all their friends, the mom's friends, and and then Dorky Mark, of course, got straight hundreds and extra credit, 110, 50, whatever. And he's like, and then you come, and they come home, they're like furious and upset, and they see you playing outside. They're like, why, why aren't you studying? You know, Mark is getting all these grades, and oh, you get so frustrated and angry towards Mark, and he didn't do anything to you. He's just doing his job, getting good grades, and listening to his parents, and being a good guy, and you just hate the guy because he's just dorky Mark, right? And you just want to get him out of your life. And so during dodgeball, I remember we purposely, just 10 of us, aimed at him. Praise God for he's a forgiving God. He's a God of grace, and you know, I fall under that too. Okay, this is the past, okay? I'm, I'm a new creation in Christ. Um, and so, you know, you know you, I'm sure you guys have that too, that one guy, that one person, right, who really, that parents always compare you to and kind of, oh man, this guy, right? This is who Paul was for the other preachers, right? Paul was, he wasn't doing it to show off. He wasn't going around sharing his word and say, this is what I know and this is what I'm going to teach you. No, he's saying, this is what God has shown me and this is the word of God that I want to show and share, the heart that he has for you, right? And so he was preaching Christ and because of this, he was able to rejoice and continue and because of this, he didn't care to the point where people were saying all these bad things to him and, and hating on the guy. It didn't matter to him because he knew his number one purpose was to preach Christ. And even in those situations, God is going to use his life to preach the gospel, right? Do we, can we look at our brothers and sisters in this loving way where, where we are all trying to live our lives to really advance the gospel for the kingdom of God? And you know what? No matter how much of a difficulty it is, knowing that, man, God is using that brother. God is using that sister in, in their talents, in their ways to really... Uh, further the kingdom. I mean, how great would it be where all of us in STEM can really not care who gets the credit when we serve, right? It's not about getting recognition. Oh, look what I did. I'm folding all the chairs. I'm picking up all the garbage. Oh, I, may, I better do it in front of the pastor, make sure he sees. Or, may, uh, you know, you tell God, God, I did these things for you. You owe me kind of a thing. What if we really genuinely became a community of believers where our hearts and passions are focused on God and God alone. 
that it didn't matter if I didn't get the credit, it didn't matter if I don't get the reward right now, God will be pleased with my actions and my attitude and my heart towards Him. And that's what God is really seeking after, those people who really want to pursue after God and be passionate for God. And I hope we get to that point that we become people who are really passionate for God. When we praise, when we worship, we do it passionately, only thinking about Jesus Christ, the love that He has shown us. You know, He has died for us upon the cross for this reason, so that we can live, so that we can worship, so that we can live a life that really honors and pleases Him, so that we can go into the world and share the Word of God with the people around us. That is the main purpose why we live each day. But so many people lose sight of this and they become bored with life and they don't know the direction of life and they become so confused and they don't know what to do and get into worldly things and their lives are such a difficult time. You know, God is really calling us today, right now, anything that you do, when you pray, when you interact in Bible study, when you worship, do it all in the eyes of the Lord. As Paul was truly a passionate man for God, didn't matter about the people around him who even persecuted him and hated him, he really loved God and that's all that mattered. I hope we get to that point where our hearts are fully sold out for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. And we just thank you so much for uh, using Paul's life that his heart was really sold out for you and passionate. And because of this, he was able to overcome, not avoid, but overcome the situations and circumstances and get through it knowing that you were with him. Lord, some of us, our week to weeks are so difficult with so much pressure and school and, and family, so many responsibility in our lives that really weigh us down at times. But Lord, help us to find rest in you, in your word. And Lord, may you begin to stir a true passion for you of who you are, that we may have this everlasting joy that will carry us through to really be fixated on you and live our daily lives right now, not later, but right now for your kingdom, to be a true kingdom worker for you, God. So we ask that you may just trans begin to transform our hearts, help us to really be broken before you as we worship, as we fellowship and as we study your word together help us to be genuinely seeking after you in this way we thank you for your word in jesus name we pray